Okay, Sunday, August 2nd, 2020, and I'm back at the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, this time not to go to the museum proper, but to go to uh, the adjacent Greenfield Village. And unfortunately, it's a rainy day, just drizzling now, but it's going to be uh, heavy rain today is expected. Well, I chose to park in the museum lot rather than in the Greenfield lot and uh, walk down this long corridor, hang right at the end. Hang a left, and there's Greenfield Village, otherwise known as the village. Now, I think I said in the Henry Ford Museum video that I just did yesterday that I don't think I'd been to the Henry Ford since 2006, and uh, I know. When I was here last, I did not go to Greenfield, so it's been even longer since I've been here. And I'll see how much uh, video I can get without getting a bunch of rain on the lens and so on. Luckily it's still drizzling, but it is supposed to get heavier. Yep, and now it's switching from drizzle to actual rain. Guess I'm gonna have to break out the umbrella. <clears throat> Once past ticket checking, they have their little train here. It might be worthwhile going on this. I don't know if they charge extra or not, just to get a view of the area, find out about this. Welcome back to Greenfield Village and the Wiser Railroad. Today we have our 1942 GE diesel electric locomotive pull on the train, and I'm Mike, your conductor. Now for the safety of our younger riders, we ask that the adults with them place themselves on the outside of the row. If that's not practical, please make sure they're held or easily within your reach. And folks, please stay seated while the train's in motion. Keep those arms and legs and especially your heads inside the rail car at all times. Please refrain from smoking, eating, or drinking anything but water aboard the Wiser Railroad. And as we begin our journey to explore the sights and sounds of nearly 300 years of American innovation on display, I'd like to remind you Greenfield Village is divided into seven districts. And as we head into Henry's Model T district, right on your left here is Henry Ford Soybean Laboratory, built right here in Greenfield Village in 1929. An actual operating facility came up with a number of products from the Magic Bean, the soybean, including fabrics, synthetic rubber, even a soybean oil-based paint that was used on the model teams. And that brings us to the birthplace of Henry Ford. Coming up on your left is the Ford Farm, built right here in Dearborn, Michigan in 1861. Henry Ford was born in that white farmhouse not too far, you know, right over there. In 1863, as a matter of fact, it was July 31st, 1863. Born right there. Coming up next, it's our Main Street District. Here you'll find the Wright Brothers' home and the Wright Cycle Shop, the birthplace of aviation. Right across the street, find out about the 57 varieties at 
the Heinz home where they first bought the horse radish. And don't forget smack dab in the middle of Main Street, it's also the center of the known universe. We're talking about the frozen custard stand. It's like the best ice cream ever. Edison at Work District and just beyond the picket fence is Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Complex, where Edison and his staff of scientists and engineers developed the very first practical incandescent light bulb. The Menlo Park Complex is America's first research and development lab responsible for such innovations as the microphone, the phonograph, and over 800 other patents. Also, coming up on your left, the mustard yellow building is the Sarah Jordan Boarding House, where Edison staff used to live. It's the first residential structure in the U.S. to be wired up for electric light. Approaching the gateway to our porches and parlors district, that's the Acne Covered Bridge from 1832 in Pennsylvania. Just beyond the bridge is our next stop of the day, and that's Susquehanna Station. From here you have full access to the entire porches and parlors district. As a matter of fact, we're not going to stop there this morning. But we're going to blast right through Susquehanna. On account, I'm on autopilot, I think. <laughs> it's the first run of the day, you know what I mean? Coming up on your left, that stone building is the Cotswold Cottage, one of the oldest buildings here at Greenfield Village, built in 1640 in Chenworth, England. At the time, it was known as the Rose Cottage, and was a very special Valentine's present from him before to his wife, Clara, in 1932, 1934, I should say, when they brought it here to Greenfield Village. Up next is our Susquehanna Plantation, built in 1835 in St. Mary's County, Maryland. It was owned by Henry and Elizabeth Carroll, a prosperous family who held lavish parties in that plantation house. Compare that to that small red house next door, that's the Thomas Plimpton home. Thomas was an indentured servant and he lived in that small one-room house with his wife and seven children. At the end of the road on the other side of our Ferris windmill is the Daggett Farm, a living history farm from 1754 in Andover, Connecticut. Stop in and see how Samuel Daggett and the family lived and worked on the farm prior to the American Revolution. And check out that kitchen garden in the back where they grew fruits and vegetables and herbs for medicinal purposes. South Carolina. So now folks, let's take a moment to sit back and relax and enjoy the sights and sounds of railroading as it was in the late 1800s and early 1900s. <laughs> restoration project, one of the largest in southeastern Michigan. Hundreds of trees have been planted and the waterways cleaned and cleared, and wildlife has returned with a herd of deer and many smaller animals as well, like rabbits, squirrels, and turtles. Birds too, like green and blue heron, egrets and Canada geese, even a big flock of wild turkeys. 
which you'll see all around the back side here of Greenfield Village. and parlors district. This is where we hold many of our special events throughout the year. Of course, with our COVID shortened season, a lot of those events had to be canceled. So the grass right now is greener than it's been in years back here. It's the Henry Ford Academy. Now, Henry Ford Academy is a charter school here in Wayne County. As you can see, it's being guarded by one of our wild turkeys today. <laughs> Children attend school for free, but are chosen by lottery. This portion of the campus houses the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. Ninth graders attend class at the Henry Ford Museum. Just up ahead, three attached rail cars. They serve as classrooms for the senior class. Since 1929. It's the Swanee Lagoon. Also on your left at the top of the hill, it's a popular wedding spot. That's the Martha Mary Chapel. Named after Henry Ford's mother and mother in law, Martha and Mary, of course. Also on your left, it's the Taste of History, a cafeteria-style restaurant. This year featuring a special menu based on recipes from some of our historic sites, like the Daggett Farm, the Firestone Farm, and the Burbank House. The Taste of History, of course, is air-conditioned, so it's a great place to stop by later on today during the heat and maybe cool off with a cold drink. And that brings us to our next stop of the day at that Smith's Creek Station. From here you have full access to Railroad Junction, Main Street, and Liberty Craft Works. If you're leaving us here, please stay seated until the train comes to a complete stop, and I give you the go-ahead to exit on the left side only. Smith's Creek Station is your stop for Main Street and the Carousel, as well as Railroad Junction and the Roundhouse. And you're just a few short steps away from the Taste of History, and Liberty Craft Works. So again, folks, if you're leaving us here, please stay seated until the train comes to a complete stop. The engineer will give you a blast, and there's the whistle. It's safe now to exit on the left side only. If you're leaving us here, look around you. 
gather up any loose items or any of those kids you left behind. As you leave the train, please leave the chain down and don't forget to put that mask back on. This is a mask on area. We're only here for a few minutes before moving out to the main gate and Firestone Station. And as we continue on now, through Railroad Junction, we're now passing the historic Smith's Creek Depot, originally built in 1858 in Smith's Creek, Michigan. It's about eight and a half miles southwest of Port Huron. Where as a boy, Thomas Edison worked for the Grand Trunk Railroad, selling treats and newspapers along the way from Port Huron to Detroit and back again. Also coming up on your far left, that brick building is our Edison Illuminating Company. It's a one quarter scale reproduction of an actual generating station from Detroit. Also coming up ahead, right in the heart of our railroad junction district, is our Detroit, Toledo, and Milwaukee roundhouse, where we repair and maintain our three coal-fired steam locomotives. Originally built in 1884 in Marshall, Michigan, we've recreated the building here at Greenfield Village in the year 2000. On the other side of the roundhouse is our Liberty Craft Works District, where artisans and craftsmen create beautiful objects of glass and pottery, tin and weaving. There's also a print shop and a sawmill. And don't forget the Davidson Gerson Glass Gallery with a spectacular collection of industrial glass. everyone till you hear the whistle blow. Still moving everyone. Please, please wait for the whistle. And there's the whistle and safe down to exit on the right side. Okay. So, post train ride. I think this is going to be a somewhat truncated or abbreviated at least tour of Greenfield because it's just going to get too miserably wet. But I'm going to try to hit a few hot spots at least and we did luckily get that train trip in so there's a bit of a overview from that Ugh, my socks are already squishing this is the rich art wagon shop 
This was the place for people to get almost anything wooden repaired. I decided to switch to my smaller camera just because it's too hard to keep the big one dry. And it's also less expendable. The little pocket camera should do okay. That's the farm area over there. Those are working farms. They have livestock and crops of various sorts. And they're growing them according to the old methods. So you can see how the corn, even though it looks fairly healthy, is very uneven. Not using the hybridized seeds, not using probably pesticides and things. So it's a very spotty crop, I'm sure, with a lower yield. This is the Ford home. When restoring this house, Henry Ford made sure everything was exactly as he remembered. For 18 months, he sent people around the country searching for the dining room stove, like the one he that was in his boyhood home. Here in this farmhouse, young Henry Ford learned the values of simplicity and hard work. Henry Ford Theater. Henry Ford wanted his teenage son, Edsel, to share his passion for tools and machines, so he built him a workshop similar to this one above the garage of their Detroit home. But it's closed. It's supposed to be a short film in there. The Bagley Avenue workshop. The doorway of this shed was too narrow to get the quadricycle outside, so Henry Ford made the doorway wider by knocking out some bricks. Which is not in evidence. Oh, maybe it is over here. drive shaft rather.
like that, even in the 1919 when he sold it as an electric start, he still would give you a, a hand print. The Cohen Millinery. Elizabeth Cohen, a young widow, ran this Detroit millinery shop as a way to earn money after her husband's death using mass-produced hat bodies and trims. Mrs. Cohen designed new hats and retrimmed old ones in the latest seasonal styles. It's closed. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of that today. They're not letting anybody in the cycle shop. It's stop at the door only. But they were bored with the business. You see, in the spring you make, in the winter you make, in the spring This is the Heinz house. This is where we began, 1869. H.J. Heinz products were the first developed in this house. They became recognizable brand and appeal to customer because of Heinz's promise of good quality and freedom from tedious work in the kitchen. So that would be the, the Heinz company. And that's supposed to be the Wright family home over there. Hey, that's good. Yep. Wow, lots of buildings. Isn't this great? Built in 1871 in Dayton, Ohio. Take a look inside the window. Well, I always have fun here. If you don't have fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs> And I was actually supposed to spend quite a bit of time here in September, just a little bit more than a month from now, with our annual Wheelman Antique Bicycle uh, Club convention. We were going to have Greenfield Village be our location and spend the whole event here several days, ride around here a lot. I was looking forward to that. But, uh,. That's a frozen custard shop there. This is the Sir John something or another. Just can't quite read it from across the street. Sir John Bennett Jewelry Shop. And with the uh, humidity here. <laughs> and the uh, cooler temperature, which is welcome. But with my mask on, which I think I technically don't have to have on just to walk around out here, but anytime you get under a roof, you're supposed to put it back on. And it's making my glasses fog up. Set on a carousel slash merry ground since I was a little kid. Mostly just to get out of the rain, but uh, it's kind of neat to be on a historical thing like this.
Okay, leaving the carousel. That was a nice little ride. I mostly enjoyed the uh, the band organ. This is the uh, town hall, by the way. Everything, everything from dances to elections took place at this gathering spot. Edison at work. This is supposed to be uh, Thomas Edison's Menlo Park complex. The Menlo Park Laboratory is the birthplace of Thomas Edison's electric lighting system, the first phonograph, and many other inventions. This was built in 1929 in Greenfield Village. It's not the original uh, Menlo Park facility. They didn't move it here from somewhere else, but it's pretty close to it. You can actually go to the original one and see that one too. house and that's where a lot of the machining was done to realize Edison's inventions Should have known that was going to happen. Never pop open a self-opening umbrella when you've got a camera with its lens exposed. It sprays water everywhere. They could also make copies of drawings here. This is uh, a recreation, a 
replica of Thomas Edison's office. He used to have his office in the corner of uh, one of the machine shops, but he wanted a bigger place and also something more impressive to investors so that they could see he was a going institution. Nice facility, professional looking, established. The rain let up a little bit temporarily. It's not more than a drizzle at the moment. This is a really nice place, and if you're here when it's not COVID-19, it's not raining, and a lot more stuff is open. On the other hand, if you do that, then it's probably crowded. Now this uh, yellow house, as they said from the train trip, was a boarding house where uh, a lot of the guys who worked in his shop, in Edison's shop, would live. And by the way, even though this is a sprawling location. It does have restrooms scattered here and there. So this is the Sarah Jordan boarding house. One of the first homes ever to be wired for electric light. Hello. Hi there. The uh, one of the first houses to be yeah, wired yeah, for electric light, and you can see the wired with uh, Edison electric lighting system, right? The old. Now, is this considered tube wiring? Did you say, or is it knob and it's spool, the or beginning of a knob and tube? Yeah. Or knob and tube. Knob yeah. And tube. Yeah. They use the little wooden uh, uh, things there to separate the wires. It's 120 right. volts of uh, electricity going through there. Yeah, they didn't wire the whole house. They wired this room, they wired uh, put one light over in Sarah's room, mm -hmm. and then uh, nothing in the dining room, but then in the back, they go on the back porch to it. Right. In the kitchen, they got one light in the kitchen, too. It was just... Can't go in, but we can look through the windows. As the docent was saying, they were mostly just putting some electricity in this for effect, demonstration purposes. But uh, otherwise, the house wasn't fully electrified. And I may have slurred that through the mask. It was not electrified other than just a few lights. And I had to switch to a, another camera just as I uh, got off the carousel back there. I was using my best camera of the pocket camera size, the one that I've been using for a lot of trips recently. And all of a sudden it came up with a lens error. It couldn't position the lens and it locked itself up and would not operate again. So luckily I brought my backup camera 
that I normally use in my house for my electronics videos and see if it uh, does an adequate job for this. It's a bit older, but it seems to be working. And this is the uh, Edison Fort Meyer Laboratory. The Edisons and the Fords both had winter cottages in Fort Myers, Florida. They often took vacations together. This is uh, the actual one from Fort Myers. It was moved from there to here. Unlike some of the other buildings that are uh, reproductions. And now the rain and the wind starts up again in earnest. Oh. Got the toll bridge. Sheep per score. Hogs per score, cattle per score. Wonder what happens if you don't have a score. You improvise. This is the Rocks Village toll house, by the way. Americans have been paying tolls to travel on certain roads since the 1600s. We're often set up before crossing a bridge. And uh, people traveling over the bridge coming from all points, often just moving towards where the bridge was to cross a river, and therefore you had a lot of people from different areas going through the same choke point or same bottleneck. And so uh, the toll keepers would often ask for news from various areas and share it to other people passing. So it was important Besides, as a method of raising money for the toll keeper or the bridge owner or both, but it was often a way to disseminate news and other information. So, our uh, train trip this morning came right by here. This is the Ackley Covered Bridge. The wooden covering on this bridge protected the bridge's structure. Unlike the structure of the bridge, the covering was inexpensive and easy to replace. Here comes that train again. Reminds me of a famous covered bridge not far from where I live. That was the center of the vintage town that surrounded it. But the, uh, the road was actually used by modern traffic on a limited basis and an overly tall or wide truck went across it and just tore the top off. 
and then it was revealed that all along the actual bridge was just a modern structure that was put there to support the reproduction covering to make it look vintagey and all along the center point of the village was a fraud <laughs> uh, it still looked nice it was just not the real McCoy from a uh, historical standpoint okay all these places here are closed, the uh, dining experiences. So we're now over in the porches and parlors part of the village. Over by the Susquehanna Station, which is just over there. So I'll walk down this way and see what there is to see. This is the Giddings family home. I may go in there on the way back. It looks like it's one of those that might be accessible. I think this is the British cottage that they brought in, moved from England. Yeah. The Cotswold Cottage. Limestone was plentiful in England. Many English homes are made from this natural resource. In England, cottages like this were small, modest homes in the country. Years later, people in the city bought cottages as a way to escape from their fast-paced lives. This was built in the early 1600s in Chedworth, Gloucestershire, England. A little country garden out here. Very nice. Looks like I can go in at least a bit. I have a couple of friends in England who I visit every couple of years who live in places like this. More modernized than this, but still the low doors and Sometimes the unimproved floors as well. One of them even had a dirt floor, hard packed dirt floor. a little barn over here. This is the Sesqua Sesquahana Plantation. 
1860, the Carroll family owned 75 enslaved men, women, and children. They worked on a variety of market crops suited to the tide-wide, tidewater region of the Chesapeake Bay. Wheat, tobacco, food needed to sustain the families. This was built between 1826 and 1836 in St. Mary's County, Maryland, and moved here. So this Susquehanna uh, building here was part of, it was the main house in the Susquehanna, Susquehanna Plantation, which was on the west side of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and at the beginning of World War II, it was no longer owned by the original people. But at the beginning of World War II, it was owned by a friend of Henry Ford's, and the Navy came and said they were uh, evicting everybody in that area to build a military facility. And so he called uh, Ford and said, hey, you know, this is a historic place. Do you want to come get it? And so they did. So it's been here since then. But the location where that was, was the, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong. Is it the Patuxet Naval Air Station? Uh, anyway, that's the air, uh, location. Ferris Windmill, built in the mid-1600s and operated at Cape Cod. This is the Daggett Farmhouse. Built in 1754 in Andover, Connecticut. Like other farm families living in hard scrabble northeastern Connecticut during the 1760s, Samuel Dagan and his family relied largely on their own skills and hard work. He worked the family farm, he built houses for other people, made furniture. His wife spun yarn, made clothing, fed the animals, taught their children how to read and write. This is the Cotswold Forge, part of the same uh, Cotswold Cottage area that they brought over, used for blacksmithing. This is actually uh, not the, the same one, I made a mistake there. This was built in the early 1600s in Snowshoal, Worcestershire, or Worcestershire, yeah. Worcester, England. Um, even though it looks stylistically the same, apparently it's not from the same location as the cottage. But it still has that same limestone. Is it limestone or sandstone? Whichever one. It matches uh, the look of this very closely.
Okay, coming back to the Giddings family home. Shipping merchant John Giddings was active in the West Indies trade during the second half of the 1700s. His ships left New Hampshire loaded with naval stores and lumber in return full of sugar, rum, and cloth. His trade connections gave him and his family access to a wide range of goods from around the globe. They displayed fashionable items in their home. Colonial frustration with British trade regulations increased during the 1760s and 1770s. Did I say 1760s? 1760s and 1770s. And the American Revolution dramatically impacted day-to-day -day life for the Giddings family. This was built in 1750 in Exeter, New Hampshire. of the Georgian style of architecture popular in England and the colonies during this time. It is constructed around a huge central chimney with separate flues for each of the five fireplaces that heated the rooms and provided a heat source for cooking in the kitchen. The hall, or keeping room, on your left, was designed to accommodate the informal daily activities of the family. It contains a number of furnishings in the Queen Anne style, popular during the mid-1700s. These uh, signs are posted around just about every intersection, help you find where you are. This is the Noah Webster home. Noah Webster had this comfortable home built in New Haven, Connecticut, where he enjoyed an active family life, wrote many of his publications, and completed his ultimate life's work, America's First Dictionary. So this is Noah Webster of dictionary fame. He and his wife moved to New Haven in their later years to be near family and friends, as well as the library at nearby Yale College. While living in this house, he published his famous American Dictionary of the English Language in 1828. This was built in Robert Frost home. This Greek Revival style home appealed to Henry Ford and he had it moved to Greenfield Village in 1937. Among its many residents over time was the American poet Robert Frost. Frost lived in the home while teaching at the University of Michigan in the 1920s. It was built in 1835 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This is uh, a little bit of a darker place, isn't it? That was the so-called Swiss Chalet. It's not an original structure from Switzerland. It was built by Henry Ford's people in, uh, I think, the 1930s 
to represent a place where a Swiss watchmaker might live and work. This is the Luther Burbank birthplace. Burbank's experiments led him to develop the russet Burbank potato, popularly known as the Idaho potato, which would become the world's most widely cultivated potato. It was built around 1800 in Lancaster, Massachusetts. And that's back down there by the uh, Edison facility. Sounds of the America, or Sounds of America Gallery. This was built around 1830 in Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania, and it's not a particular building of note, it's just one that they're using to uh, play and illustrate various things having to do with Stephen Foster, the American composer and songwriter. These uh, white buildings over here are the Hermitage Slave Quarters from, uh, can't quite read the year without crossing the street, built around 1820 in Savannah, Georgia, or near Savannah, Georgia. The Mattox family home built around 1880 in Bryan County, Georgia by Amos Maddox's father Andrew on land purchased from by his grandfather Amos Morell, both of whom had been formerly enslaved. This is the Charles Steinmetz cabin, built in 1896 on the banks of the Veal Creek in Mohawk Valley, upstate New York. I'm probably going to be told by somebody that I got that pronounced wrong. Veal Creek, Veal Creek, Veal Creek, V I E L E. Uh, Charles Steinmetz was surprised when Camp Mohawk was struck by lightning, shattering a large mirror. But that twist of fate led to some of his greatest investigations in electricity. Steinmetz built this camp in addition, this cabin, in addition to a few other buildings to create Camp Mohawk, his distraction free retreat. He was regarded as the greatest electrical engineer of his day. Standing little more than four feet tall, he overcame a painful spinal deformity to study mathematics and engineering at a German university. He later came to the United States and found work with the General Electric Company. There and in this cabin, he came up with ways to make alternating current practical and useful. Not a lot of room to work in here. There's this little office which maybe you could sleep in. I don't know if that's a hammock or what there, but uh, work table, chairs. Of course, I don't know if that's the way he had it laid out, but uh, picture of Steinmetz and Edison.
Steinmetz found it most comfortable to work at his table, kneeling on a straight chair, a pillow under his knees. Steinmetz was known as the Wizard of Electricity because he used advanced mathematics to solve problems associated with alternating current electricity. His work was crucial to the development of electrical networks that we now depend upon, such as the Berid. This little cabin was a retreat for Dr. Steinmetz. He, became, he came here to relax in the peace and quiet, but mainly he came here to think and solve problems relating to his work. In this room, this is where he worked and slept. Because of his painful, painful spinal deformity, he found it more comfortable to sleep in a hammock than a regular bed. The supplies he needed to work out his complicated mathematical equations were sparse and practical. Out on the porch, uh, he just liked the view. This uh, cabin was in uh, New York State, of course. It wasn't here. Very interesting. Adams family home. The front parlors of homes in the late 1800s were formal, used for entertaining visitors and hosting weddings and funerals. Back parlors were places for families to relax. George Matthew Adams grew up in this modest home. His column, Today's Talk, appeared in newspapers across the country. This house was built in 1840 in Saline, Michigan and some additions were put on in the 1870s. Well, at least the rain has let up for a while. That's nice. Very comfortable out here now. The Chapman family home built in 1860 in Dearborn Township, Michigan. This modest house was the home of country school teacher John Brainerd Chapman and his wife Susie. He taught several terms in one-room schools in Dearborn and Springwells Townships. The rest of the time he worked as a farmhand and as a cooper making barrels for local farmers. He was known for his ability to keep order in the classroom. He taught during the winter term when older boys attended school since they were not needed on the farm. He was Henry Ford's favorite teacher. When Chapman moved from Scotch Settlement to Miller School, young Henry followed him. The William Holmes McGuffey Schoolhouse. Students, students learn to read and write in frontier schoolhouses like this one. This log schoolhouse named for educator William Holmes McGuffey invokes one-room schoolhouses that dotted the frontier in the early 1800s. This was built here at the Greenfield Village. Logs from the McGuffey property uh, in Washington County, Pennsylvania. So the building is not original, but uh, the logs came from the correct location. Forest Service, including a little hut. I don't know if that's an outhouse or storage for equipment. Maybe it'll say on the sign. This is where William Holmes McGuffey was born. He created his easy-to-understand eclectic readers based on his unique upbringing and experiences on the frontier. Here in this snug cabin, the McGuffey family ate, lived, slept, and visited with friends and family from nearby. 
It was built in 1790 in Washington County, Pennsylvania. George Washington Carver Cabin, built in 1942 here in Greenfield Village. It's not an original structure. <clears throat> the outside of this building was modeled after Missouri Slave Cabin, where jo George Washington Carver was born. It's based on his memories of the cabin. George Washington Carver was born into slavery, but was later known for his achievements as an agricultural chemist. He looked for ways that southern farmers could move from cotton-only farms to those that grew a variety of crops. He is best known for his experiments with peanuts and sweet potatoes, using them for food, ink, and rubber. So that pretty much brings us to the end of the porches and parlors area. So I'm more or less in the middle of the park now from one side to the other. That um, light blue circle there is the Sewanee Lagoon that we saw from the train. And it's just over there, but um, I may walk down there. Oh, that's pretty. I don't know my flowers very well. Are these pansies? That's all I can think of at the moment. Scotch Settlement School. Built in 1861 in Dearborn Township, Michigan. At the October 1929 dedication of Greenfield Village, Henry Ford sat at a desk here that was situated in the same location where he sat as a boy. He then carved his initials into the replica desk just as he had done at the original so many years ago. There's the Suwannee Lagoon down there. And that's known as Suwannee Landing down there. Garden of the Leavened Heart. This is a formal Renaissance style garden with well defined plantings and manicured lawns. Henry Ford's wife Clara liked the style of old fashioned knot gardens. She was inspired to create this one by the president of a national garden club. Leavened in the title means lightened. It was created in 1938. This uh, structure right next to the garden is the Martha Mary Chapel, built in 1929 here in Greenfield Village. Henry Ford built this chapel as a tribute to his mother. The chapel is currently used for wedding ceremonies, but no regularly scheduled services are held here. In Greenfield Village, this chapel illustrates the importance of churches in American colonial settlements where they fulfilled both the spiritual and social needs of the local population.
as the recorded announcement says, this is mostly just used for weddings today. It's not used for actual church services or normal regular church services. Looks like it's possible to get some lunch here. Sit down for a little while, rest my aching back. And this, by the way, is the so-called Taste of History cafeteria. And I could dine outside, but it's still slightly wet out there. Roast turkey sandwich with mayo and mustard. A cup of onion soup and water. Yeah, here's where it says taste of history. <clears throat> I think they've definitely improved this a lot, at least visually since I was here many years ago. I don't remember it looking this nice. This is the Eagle Tavern, built in 1931 in Clinton, Michigan. Apparently you could usually get food in here, but it's closed at this point in time. Adam Fourpaw's new and greatest all-feature show. Fourpaw's, haha, ha. it's a dog show. Village Pavilion. <clears throat> I'm already losing track of whether I went down this way or not before, so I guess I'll walk it again briefly. Yeah, the John Bennett Jewelry Shop.
Yeah, I have been down this way, sort of. I went here when it was raining. All the buildings were closed to visitors. Looks like a uh, watch shop. Okay, go down this way. See the roundhouse. This is just a restaurant. This is the Edison Illuminating Company's Station A. Reduced scale replica of the original Station A building built here in Greenfield Village in 1944. Henry Ford built his first car, the quadricycle, while he was employed at the Edison Illuminating Company. Early power plants like this one helped light up entire communities. Workers at the Edison Illuminating Company built and maintained early electrical systems in downtown Detroit. The company Station A was one of Detroit's first electric power plants. Henry Ford worked here in the 1890s, rising to become chief engineer. <clears throat> Generators here. size okay so way smaller yeah well, they didn't, yeah not to put the, yeah uh, the real thing but, uh, there would have been coal here mm -hmm. and there would have been a fireman shoveling 750 pounds of coal into that boat every hour now they're opening up things here and there have a good day yeah, try and get that plaque on the front there.
The actual generators are upstairs, but we can't go up there. 